My name is Johann Freudenberg from Germany. What do you think would be the consequences of a strong decline of the housing market for sales of carpet retailers and manufacturers? Thank you. Well, if there's a strong decline in the housing market, my guess is that whatever we lose in carpet will be making up for somewhere else because uh, uh, it would a lot of the psychological well-being as well as the financial well-being of the American people is tied up with the fact or comes from the fact that they feel so good about what has happened with their home ownership over the years and, and with many people it's been by far the best behaving asset that they've had so uh, if there is indeed some kind of a bubble and and it's it's pricked at some point uh, my guess is that we would feel that in various ways in our operating businesses, but that, but that in terms of what we could do with our capital, the, the net, the net effect of Berkshire might well be uh, quite quite positive. Uh, we're not big on macro forecasts. I mean, this foreign exchange thing is quite different than what we've done over time and, and the way we've made money. Uh, so we are. It isn't like we've got some great track record of predicting macro uh, factors and have made a lot of money doing that. We've, we've made money by looking at things like PetroChina or whatever it may be and just deciding that here's a very good business that selling at a very cheap price. Um, certainly at the high end of the, of the uh, real estate market in some areas, I mean, you've seen some extraordinary uh, movement. and. I've referred to this before, but 25 years ago or so, uh, we saw the same thing in farmland in Nebraska and Iowa and surrounding areas. Uh, we had people running from cash. Cash is trash, and people, were, you know, they were worried about the fact that inflation was out of control in the late 70s and before Volcker did his stuff. Uh, people were fleeing from cash, and one of the ways they gave vent to that fear was to rush into farmland, and there was a farm about 30 miles north of here that sold for about $2,000 an acre in roughly 1980, and a few years later, I bought it from the, from the FDIC for $600 an acre. And you can say, how can you go crazy about farmland? It's going to produce about 45 bushels an acre of soybeans, about 120 bushels an acre of corn, and there's no way you could dream about it tripling or the internet causing, you know, corn yields to go up or something of the sort. But uh, people went crazy on it, and the consequences were huge in terms of banks failing, lots of banks failing in, in this area, banks that had gone through the Great Depression, but the people went, they just went a little crazy. People go crazy. In, in, in economics periodically in all different kinds of ways. And, you know, you had the Resolution Trust Corp come out of the savings and loan nuttiness that took place in real estate where they financed everything that, that uh, was put before them. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I will not, I don't know where we stand in terms of the residential housing cycle. And it, it, it has different behavior characteristics simply because people live in the houses in many, great many cases. <clears throat> so it will not behave necessarily the same as other markets, but when you get prices increasing at far, far greater rates than construction costs or, or inflationary factors, it, it, uh, uh, sometimes there can be some pretty serious consequences. Charlie? Yeah, it's in a place like Omaha, there's not much of a housing price bubble, is there, Warren? No, there's not no. been a bubble, but I would say that that residential real estate probably has is, is, uh, increased in price at a rate quite a bit faster than the general inflation rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you get to Laguna, California, or Montecito, California, or the better suburbs of Washington, D.C., you have a real asset price bubble. Uh, I have a relative that to move to a good school district in the suburbs of Virginia, uh, she'll have to pay four times as much as she can get from selling her nice Omaha house. Yeah, well, I that's sold. A, that's a price bubble. I sold a house a few months ago in Laguna for three and a half million dollars. Now it sold the first day, so I probably listed it too cheap. Uh, so don't don't count on me for residential real estate advice. But but that house, the 
the physical house would probably cost a half a million or thereabouts. So in effect, the land went for $3 million uh, implicitly. And the land is probably on the area of 2,000 square feet, which is a little less than 1 20th of an acre. Now you've got streets and all that sort of thing involved. But, but basically, I think that land sold for about $60 million an acre, uh, which that fellow that you saw in the farm outfit in the movie <laughs> finds like, sounds like a pretty, pretty fancy price for almost any kind of land. Charlie, you've witnessed it firsthand, though, out there. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a, one of the Berkshire directors lives adjacent to what I regard as a pretty modest little house, which sold for $27 million recently. Now, these are houses that look right at the ocean, and there isn't a great deal of available shoreline in California, and there are a lot of people. But you have some very extreme housing price bubbles going on, and and uh, you would think there might be a real possibility that it could go in the other direction someday. At 27 million, I'd rather stare at my bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, do you think the shift in the banking system during the 90s to finance home purchases with 0% down impacted the overall savings rate as home purchases are the largest investment most people make and the overall rise of home prices driven by these marginal buyers? If so, how would you suggest that we, we correct the problem? Yeah, of course, any time a home is constructed, it represents somebody's savings. I mean, it, the, the home buyer may buy it for nothing down, but that means he's borrowing 100% of the mortgage through a mortgage that somebody else has saved somewhere, maybe intermediated three or four times or something of the sort. But, but home construction comes about through savings. Now, there's no question that terms have become easier and easier, and I've talked to certain mortgage bankers about this subject, but terms have become easier and easier as prices have increased. Now, that is absolutely counter to, you know, how people think about lending in general. Generally, the more the asset class becomes inflated, the less a prudent banker will lend. But of course, in this country now, you have mortgages intermediated in a way that the person buying the mortgage, in the case of, I'm thinking of Fred, Freddie and Fannie and other forms like that, so we're talking about the lower priced houses, but the mortgage buyer does not need to care about what kind of mortgage, what kind of a, a financial transaction the purchase is. Well, all they have to do is look at the guarantee, and they look at that rather than, than whether somebody's put any money down or anything of the sort. So I think you've had easy financing facilitating a, a, a boom in real estate prices, even at the higher levels. And I think that that, that uh, which has occurred in other asset classes in the past, I mean, that farm, farm bubble I talked about was facilitated by the fact that banks in small towns who generally have been very conservative in lending went crazy uh, around 1980 and they lent amounts that the farm itself could never repay. They started saying a farm was an asset appreciation investment, not an income investment. And once you talk about something that's an asset appreciation investment, ignoring the underlying economics of, of, of what you're lending on, you're really talking about the bigger fool game. You're saying, you know, that this is a silly price, but there'll be a bigger fool that comes along. And that actually can be a profitable game for a while, but it's nothing that bankers should, should engage in. So I would say that, that Easy lending obviously does contribute to overall in the country to a lower savings rate. But in, the, in, the, in effect, somebody has to send, save for somebody else to borrow. And what is happening now is the rest of the world is saving. So that in the U.S., I'm, in, in global terms I'm talking, but the rest of the world is saving. And they're sending us $2 billion. Uh, I mean, we're sending uh, uh, them, in effect, claims or ownership of $2 billion. They're investing $2 billion a day in the United States. But they, a lot of economists will say, well, that's what's really going on. The world loves our assets so much and they have so much confidence in America that the present current account deficit is driven by the fact they want to invest. I don't believe that at all. I think, I think, I think it's just silly, frankly, to make that argument. The, um, they are investing because they have to uh, because of our consumption 
habits and, and, and not because they want to, and I think the declining dollar is evidence of that. Charlie? Well, I've got nothing to add to that. It's obvious that the easy lending on houses causes more houses to be built and causes housing prices to be uh, uh, higher probably in the, in the new field. Eventually, of course, the, if you construct enough new anything, you can have a countervailing effect. In other words, if you built way too many houses, you'd eventually cause a price decline. I'll give you a fanciful illustration. Let's just assume that Omaha had a totally constant population. No one was allowed to leave. No one was entered. Birth rate equal death rate, all of that sort of thing. So the population was constant. And nobody could build any more houses. We just passed a city ordinance to that effect. But every year, uh, everybody sold their house to their neighbor. So first year, everybody sold their $100,000 house to their neighbor. And uh, they both switched houses, and that was fine. And then the next year, they agreed we were going to do it at 150000 and you can say, well, how could that be? Well, we would all go to Freddie or Fannie and get our mortgages guaranteed for a larger amount, and somebody in New York or, or Tokyo or someplace would, would buy the uh, Freddie or Fannie paper, and we'd have an influx of $50,000 per household. We'd all have the same number of houses. We'd all be living one house to a, to, a, to a family, and we'd have marked up our houses, and we'd now have a bigger mortgage, but we'd have $50,000 more of income that year just to service a little higher mortgage. And we'd do the same thing the following year for 200000 and so on. Now, that would be very transparent, and people might catch on to the fact there was something funny going on in Omaha. But you can have an accidental aggregation of behavior that somewhat leads to the same effect. I and mean, if you keep marking up something, and in the process, the payment for the marked up price comes from someone else who feels they are bearing no risk because they've got the government guarantee in between, the money can just flood in and everybody feels very happy for a long time. And we don't have anything like the fanciful thing I set forth in terms of Omaha, but we have certain aspects of that, I think, going on in the economy. Charlie, would you, well, I'm throwing this one at you, would you agree or not? Yeah, I do agree with that. You have buried Ponzi effects in various parts of any modern economy, and they're very important, and they're very little studied in economics. Considering the characteristics of larger size commercial real estate investments like REITs that can uh, have the behavior and financial returns of an operating business, why not invest in real estate? Uh, is it because you just don't like the returns or the business is just not attractive? Yeah, well, Charlie got a start in real estate, right, Charlie? Yeah, I would say, number one, that in a corporation like Berkshire that's taxable under subchapter C of the Internal Revenue Code, owning real estate is grossly disadvantaged compared to owning it directly by individuals such as yourself. That's number one. And number two, real estate, investment real estate is having bubble valuation problems of its own right now. Uh, all my rich friends who own real estate are selling their worst properties, and they're getting bids that come in higher than their highest expectations, and people are competing to take these things off their hands. Uh, I do not find it exciting, and it certainly doesn't fit Berkshire. Name me a lot of C corporations that have been passive holders in real estate and have done well over a whole lot of years. It's almost a null class. Yeah, Charlie and I, I mean both, more Charlie than, than I, uh, We've had certain personal real estate investments over time, and it, it, you know it's a field that, in general, we understand. We don't bring that much special to the game, but we, we understand it. We've made money in it. And uh, actually, at the time that the NASDAQ about hit its high, uh, REITs were quite cheap, in my view. And I, I, would, I have a less than 1 percent of my net worth outside of Berkshire, but basically I had, a, I had that portion all in REITs. They were all small ones at that time, and, and, but they were selling at discounts at that time. They were selling at discounts to the values of properties, and those values of properties were much more conservatively figured than today. Today, you have uh, very fancy prices on 
on uh, real estate. And on top of that, you have the REITs uh, often selling at a premium to those. So I regard REITs as quite unattractive now, certainly compared to five or six years ago. Uh, but that's, an ass that, that's a group of so securities. that's for an individual you regard them as unattractive. Yeah. And for a corporation, that much more so. Yeah, right, right. It, uh, uh, the situation changed dramatically from five or six years ago. I mean, the stock market, in many respects, from the 1999-2000 period is down significantly. REITs are up significantly. REITs were very unpopular five or six years ago. Now they're popular. And it's, it's, it's better to pay attention to something that is being scorned than something that's being, being championed. And, and uh, there's really been a big change in the REIT situation in the last five or six years. And the REITs have phony accounting. <clears throat> Otherwise, we love them. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to bring up anything in these meetings. <laughs>